Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Police officers take the job knowing the inherent risks, and they vow to protect and serve, and most take that oath very seriously. Davina Buff Jones was one of these officers. Being a female police officer has its own unique challenges, but Davina stood 4 foot 11 inches tall and weighed only 90 pounds. Her physical stature influenced her personality quite a bit. She felt she had much to prove, and part of that was a personal mantra that she always followed the rules. Always. No exceptions. She would not back down. It didn't matter who tried to intimidate her. But she worked for a tiny police department on the luxury island of Bald Head, North Carolina where the rules were informally different for wealthy residents of the island and where the business of tourism superseded any and all other issues on the island. This made her an unpopular officer, and in October of 1999, she was found dead, shot in the back of the head. The island fire chief ordered the scene hosed down because there was a wedding scheduled the next morning, destroying the crime scene and any evidence. And then just days later, the Brunswick County DA quietly closed her case as a suicide, releasing an official statement six weeks later. It took two years for her family to get that changed to undetermined, and five more years to get it changed to homicide. The case is still open to this day, but without evidence, there's nothing the new DA can do. There will probably never be justice for Officer Davina Buff Jones, but we can keep telling her story. Let's not let it just be Bald Head Island's dirty little secret. Welcome to episode 38, Officer Davina Buff Jones, Murder and Cover Up on Bald Head Island. Bald Head Island, North Carolina, was historically known as Smith Island, and it got its name from the dunes on its south beach. Over the centuries, the dunes have become worn down and resemble a bald head. Gorgeous white sand beaches cover three sides of the island, with marsh on the northern side. Bald Head is the southernmost of North Carolina's Cape Islands, and it's located at the tip of Cape Fear, a prominent headland along the Atlantic coast. It's nestled at the convergence of Cape Fear River and the Atlantic Gulf Stream. It's about six square miles, or nine and a half kilometers, with landmass trailing off into the sea, creating about 30 miles of treacherous sandbars known as the Frying Pan Shoals. But Bald Head Village only comprises about two miles of the island proper. The rest is beaches, marshes, and maritime forests. You can only reach the island by boat. It's a 20-minute ferry ride from Deep Point Marina on the mainland to the harbor at Bald Head. And it's also a two-mile journey across the Cape Fear River from Southport, North Carolina. And that geography naturally lends to the exclusivity of the luxury island. With less than 200 year-round residents, the business of Bald Head is tourism. But this would mainly be for the one percenters. Even the smallest of homes, with views only of marshes, are priced in the millions. To vacation there, especially in peak season, would cost you thousands. But it is quite the tourist experience. There's a full-service marina, luxury golf course, day spa, many high-end boutiques, and of course phenomenal seafood. Baldhead is also nationally recognized for sea turtle nesting, and visitors use the phrase, I'm on turtle time, for the carefree feeling of being on Baldhead Island. Follow the Baldhead Island hashtag on Instagram to see wannabe models, health and beauty bloggers, and sightseers at Old Baldy, the island's historic lighthouse. See the rich being rich, hashtagging their way through beautiful sun-drenched but heavily filtered vacations. It is a gorgeous setting, idyllic for photography and even movies. The famous lighthouse, Old Baldy, was used in the opening scene of the 90s movie, The Butcher's Wife and Bald Head Island Village was used for the set of the movie Weekend at Bernie's. The only cars on the island are for law enforcement and emergency services. Residents and visitors get around only on golf carts and bicycles. That's suitable to the terrain of the island, where most roads are not roads at all, but crudely paved paths. It's also suitable for some often inebriated residents and visitors who notoriously get their children to drive them around in golf carts. Bald Head has a lot of interesting history, too. For centuries, it was a haven for bootleggers due to its proximity to Cape Fear River and its seclusion. 
In the 17th and 18th centuries, pirates ruled the waters off the coast of North Carolina, and Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard, used Baldhead Island as a hideout. This past June, Baldhead Island celebrated the 300th anniversary of Blackbeard's death with an event called Pirate Invasion. Residents and visitors enjoyed a festival of music, dancing, boats decorated as pirate ships, and even a treasure hunt. The signature lighthouse, known as Old Baldy, was built in 1817 and is the oldest in North Carolina. Erected from red bricks with walls five feet thick at its base, it's been bombarded with sand and lime over the years, giving it a weathered and sort of dirty facade. Positioned some four miles from the eastern end of the island and equipped with only minor light, a single beam that shoots straight up, the lighthouse was unsuccessful in guiding ships safely past the frying pan shoals during storms and fog. Another lighthouse was built out on the shoals in 1854. In 1903, Old Baldy was decommissioned when the Cape Fear Light was erected on the eastern end of the island, but it still serves as a prominent day marker for mariners and is itself a tourist attraction. Old Baldy is a five-minute walk from the ferry landing. Visitors go to the Keeper's Cottage to purchase tickets for admission to the museum and to climb the 108 stairs to the top of Old Baldy to see the breathtaking views. But again, along with the beauty and history of Baldhead Island, is the luxury. Only the uber-rich live there year-round, and it's not a place that average Americans can afford to vacation. And it's in this atmosphere of wealth and privilege that Officer Davina Buff Jones came to work as a rookie police officer in 1999. Davina was born in July of 1966 to parents Loy and Harriet Buff in Charlotte, North Carolina. She was the middle child of three sisters. She was named for her father, David Loy, but she didn't like explaining her unusual name, so she chose to go by Dee, though her daddy preferred to call her Vanny. Dee had been a sickly little girl, suffering from chronic colds and illnesses, including asthma. She lost the hearing in her right ear when she was still young due to a residual ear infection. To compensate, she learned to read lips, but she often talked too loud because she couldn't judge the volume. And she was a tiny girl, never reaching five foot tall, even in adulthood. Her hips were also uneven, something she would be self-conscious of her whole life. She hated wearing dresses because she felt they accentuated her hips. But for a tomboy, that wasn't much of a problem. Dee loved animals and was a skilled horseback rider. She wanted to be a veterinarian when she grew up. Her teen years were spent working in her parents' restaurant, the Peddler Steakhouse, in Charlotte. She was the hostess and was loved by customers and fellow employees for her sunny personality and hard work. A lot of celebrities frequented the peddler. NASCAR drivers, famous golfers, and even Michael Jordan and the UNC basketball team were all known to be regulars. In personality, Dee could be exuberant and upbeat, but she also had her dark moments. There were two suicide attempts in her teen years, only one of which was in earnest. I will talk more about these later in the episode when we get to the court rulings. Also, family and friends say that she suffered not only from Napoleon Syndrome, but also Middle Child Syndrome meaning she could be a hothead and also act out for attention, often feeling like the world was against her. Davina married for the first time at age 24 to a man named Harry Adams. She lived with her husband and stepson on a horse farm in Lancaster, South Carolina. But the marriage ended just four years later when the couple declared bankruptcy. She remarried in 1994 to a man named Jeff Jones. He also had been previously married and came with a daughter. According to her family, he was mentally and physically abusive to Dee, and their marriage only lasted two years, during which time Davina was charged and found guilty of simple assault when she spit on her stepdaughter's mother. She would characterize the incident as fighting for what she thought was right for her stepdaughter. But it's safe to say that Davina was in a very volatile situation to begin with. Not long into the marriage, Dee, who desperately wanted children of her own, discovered her husband was taking medication that would prevent her from getting pregnant. To make matters worse, the medication was used to treat herpes. She finally left Jeff and moved back in with her parents, who had retired to Oak Island. Davina drifted a bit, trying to recover from her divorces and figure out what she wanted to do with her life. She worked as a bank teller, and then she worked for a veterinarian, but she hadn't found her place yet. At the urging of friends, she enrolled in basic law enforcement training at Brunswick Community College. She had a hard time due to her short stature. If Dee was picked on, she would fight back. 
So she quit the program, but eventually enrolled in the same program at Cape Fear Community College, graduating in 1998. Her family felt a little wary and naturally protective of her, but Davina was ecstatic. She felt that she'd finally found her calling. She still wasn't satisfied with her personal life, but she was very self-aware and always trying to improve upon herself. She had two Australian shepherds named Lord Adam and Precious Queen that she doted on. She lived alone with her dogs, who she called her babies, in a small house on Oak Island. She also sought treatment for depression and began taking antidepressants. I will spend more time on her mental health later in the episode as it relates to her death ruling. But I think it's very important to note that Davina was not only self-aware, but proactive about her depression. When she was hired on at Baldhead Island, she excitedly bought her uniform and supplies, dressed up, and had her mother take her picture. Her grin is wide, and she looks proud and happy in this photo. Considering that Dee had worked in restaurants and around celebrities, this job seemed like a good fit. It wasn't like she wasn't used to the rich and famous. But Davina had very strict values. She took her job very seriously, and she did things by the book. She was known for her honesty and integrity. Sometimes she was even considered painfully honest. And those qualities didn't exactly serve a police officer on the luxury island of Bald Head. Bald Head Village Management's first priority was their residents and high-paying visitors. The concept of law and order was really just crowd management. Make sure people are safe. Write the ticket if you have to, but then tear it up. Give them a warning. Don't bust the teenagers. Just pour out their beers and move on. And for God's sake, could you smile a little? Baldhead Island police officers were little more than glorified security guards. They were expected to keep the peace, make sure the drunks got home safely, and corral unruly teens, but no one really wanted them to actually reprimand people. The residents, and especially many of the visitors, felt the money they spent made them entitled to behave as they wished. If they wanted to ride around in their golf cart, three sheets to the wind, small children in tow, that was their business. They didn't need some snot-nosed lady cop telling them what to do. And they complained about Davina loudly and frequently. Residents and council members didn't just complain to her superior officer, but to the village manager, Wade Horn, who then came down hard on Dee's chief, who incidentally was also a woman. But to characterize the situation as just hard for Davina and her chief would be unfair. As I said before, Baldhead Island didn't want a real police force. It was barely funded at all. Ten officers worked out of a single wide trailer and were told to bring in their own toilet paper and paper towels. The equipment that was furnished was substandard and often secondhand. The radios in their trucks were old and didn't always work. When Chief Karen Grasty managed to get a supplier to discount just two police radios, her purchase request was denied by village manager Wade Horn. In later years, Mr. Horn would give interviews that would make it seem he was sympathetic to Davina's case and that he disagreed with the outcome. But I think it was easier years later, when he no longer worked for the village, to say the things he did. When truth be told, he may not have caused the botched investigation, but he most certainly contributed to the culture of the island. The culture where a high-profile wedding trumped preserving a crime scene. A culture in which a slain police officer was thrown on a gurney without being covered, left outside on a ferry dock for hours for anyone to gawk at. A culture that allowed someone on that island to get away with murder. At this time, I'm going to pause for a word from our sponsor. Davina Buff Jones was a good police officer. Sure, she was a little green, and it was not uncommon for rookie officers to be a bit gung-ho, but that's not what this was. This was the real Davina. But it didn't win her any favors. In her 10 months with the Bald Head Island Police, there were seven complaints lodged against her. Most were from residents who didn't appreciate Davina enforcing the law. She was characterized as rude and off-putting in these complaints, which is actually contrary to internal evaluations. Chief Karen Grasty wanted Davina to work on making her voice more assertive. Dee's diminutive size already worked against her, and she needed to be more commanding with her voice. The chief felt she was too halting and nervous. This would explain some of her interactions with residents and visitors that didn't go well. Sometimes she would appear to be bullied, especially if it involved a group of people. Some teenagers she busted a couple of weeks before her death surrounded her and tried to physically intimidate her. Dee still threw out their alcohol, but was baited into a verbal confrontation in which she used profanity. 
As drunk as the leader of this pack was, he still had the wherewithal to complain the next day about her language. And he had witnesses. So Dee was reprimanded and made to apologize to the little shit. Who, by the way, didn't face any formal charges for underage drinking, much less intimidating a police officer. When it came down to these ugly situations with the entitled residents and visitors, Dee always lost. After this incident, she was put on night shifts. Not only was it humiliating, but Dee understandably had trouble sleeping and adjusting. Then, just a week before her death, Chief Grasty sent her a memo instructing Davina to ride with her partner, effectively putting her back in training. Privately, Karen Grasty tried to reassure Davina that she was only trying to keep her safe and help her learn to deal with the entitled civilians. She also claimed that Dee wasn't the only rookie cop put back into training, though I did not find a name for any other officers that were required to ride with partners. And Dee didn't always ride with her partner, Keith Kane, but the two kept their vehicles together on calls. It's not clear why the memo wasn't enforced, or if just by keeping their vehicles together, the chief was satisfied that she was being supervised. But it didn't help much. On the day before her death, a resident actually lodged a complaint against Dee for speeding to an emergency call. She was escorting an ambulance, and she was driving in front as her partner followed behind. The resident claimed she was going about 70 miles per hour, which on this island and in those roads is an absolutely ridiculous claim. Through witnesses, her statement, and a reenactment, Dee's name was cleared. She was not speeding. But even if she was, isn't that what police do in an emergency? The only reason she wasn't was due to the terrain. The roads are narrow and rocky, and even emergency vehicles rarely get over 30 miles per hour. Though she was vindicated, Davina felt demoralized at having to prove herself. And it was just piling on to all of her troubles with the department, which incidentally worked very close with fire and EMS. I mention this because at the time of her death, she was pursuing a sexual harassment claim against an EMS worker named Michael Ilvento. She had met Ilvento at an emergency call at a restaurant where a child had fallen off a golf cart in the parking lot. The child was passed out and Davina was holding his head trying to stabilize as Ilvento was putting on the neck brace. Davina said he put on the wrong size brace first and as he was moving to get the right size, he ran his hand up her leg and then grabbed her crotch, rubbing his hand against her vagina. She pushed his hand away and said nothing at the time, just trying to handle the emergency. But she did report the incident to her supervising officer, who had also been her training officer, Robert Willis. Willis told her to just let it go. This wasn't too shocking to Dee, as she had butted heads with him for a while. She didn't appreciate how he dressed her down in front of other officers. She said that he humiliated her and made fun of her. It's also worth noting that Robert Willis was caught up in his own sexual harassment suit just a couple of months after Davina's death. He also played a key role at the crime scene where Davina was killed, but I'll come back to that. My point is, Davina was struggling on every front at work. It wasn't just the residents and visitors. Her colleagues were disrespectful and sexist, and her supervisors either made it worse or brushed it under the rug. She had told her best friend, Laura Atkins, that her partner, Keith Kane, had warned her that the brass was looking to get rid of her. She had made too many waves with locals. She got into too much conflict within the department. She had better keep her nose clean if she wanted to keep her job. So Davina was trying to do that. She followed orders, but she was also turning in resumes all over North Carolina. She'd had enough. I think with Kane's warning, she knew it was hopeless and started looking for other positions. To make matters worse, her personal life was just as messy and hurtful as her professional. Dee had some recent relationships that were equally as damaging as her marriages had been. One was with a Brunswick County Sheriff's deputy, who was also a relative of Sheriff Ron Hewitt. His name was Will Hewitt. He had evidently fallen hard for Davina, who rejected him. He was too intense and made her nervous. She tried to remain friends with him, but he often showed up without calling to her house, and she was actively avoiding him at the time of her death, telling her best friend and sister that she was scared of Will. Will Hewitt was known as a loose cannon around the sheriff's office, and incidentally, he had no alibi for several hours the night Davina was killed. The other ex-boyfriend was more recent and had actually broken Dee's heart. Scott Monzen was a divorced Oak Island police officer who had lived with Davina briefly. Right before her murder, Scott had broken up with her after he had come to her house and had sex with her one final time. When it was over, he said he was going back to his ex-wife. He had used her, and she was devastated. A couple of weeks before her death, she got drunk, which she rarely did, and rode out to Scott's house. 
He took her back to her house, but she kept calling him and driving around. He eventually called Oak Island Patrol to go look in on her. They convinced her to stay off the roads and go to bed. But Davina and Scott did still keep talking. She called him three nights on the night of her death. In fact, he was the last person she spoke with. He told investigators that in the last call, Davina wanted to be assured that they were still friends, and he told her they were. He said she did not sound upset or distraught. Scott also told police that while they were seeing each other, Davina told him about drug activity on the island. He said she knew there were big drug deals going on down by the lighthouse. Kilos of cocaine and suitcases of money is how he described it. He said Davina was looking to make a big bust to make a name for herself. And she had befriended a Brunswick County narcotics officer named Norman McLeod. He was also her local Fraternal Order of Police representative, and she had met him when she filed a complaint with the FOP concerning her sexual harassment case. She hadn't wanted to press charges. She just wanted to see that Mike Elvento was disciplined to make sure he didn't harass or assault any other women he worked with. But she was getting nowhere with her supervisors. No one was taking the complaint seriously. There was one supervisor who advised her to put it into writing, Interim Chief Jean Hardy. The letter was dated September 18, 1999, but the letter and all copies went missing after Davina's death. Chief Karen Grasty, who was out on medical leave, had been very upset that she took her complaint to the Fraternal Order of Police. She informed Davina that it was a fireable offense, though once Dee became visibly upset, Grasty assured her she would not fire her. I'm sure, as a female chief, she felt it looked bad that Davina had to contact the Fraternal Order of Police for help. But to me, it is bad. Whatever pressure Grasty was under, she should have supported Davina. So what was Dee supposed to do? Her own supervising officer refused to do anything about it. Chief Grasty didn't want to get involved, and even the formal letter she wrote was being ignored. And unfortunately, Norman McLeod was not a good man to confide in, even though he was the representative for the FOP. Though she told her boyfriend Scott Monson and her best friend about it, McLeod denied that Davina ever told him about any drug activity on the island, which is very interesting considering she left him a ferry pass so that she could meet with him on the night of her murder. A pass which he did use. At this time, I'm going to pause for a commercial break. The tape I just played for you is Davina's radio call to CECOM right before her murder. You can hear her say she's out with three, meaning she is approaching three people. After she says, stand by please, there's a moment of silence and then the radio cuts back on. Then you can hear her say, there ain't no reason to have a gun here on Baldhead Island, okay? You want to put the gun down. Come on, do us a favor and put the gun down. And then there is a loud noise. It sounds like feedback. And if you listen closely, you can hear Davina say, Oh my God, my God. The Generation Y podcast covered Davina's case last April, episode number 228. Justin and Aaron cleaned the audio up even more, and you can hear Davina more clearly at the end. I also suggest listening to their episode for more insight on this case. I'm not going to play the rest of the recording because it is hard to understand. But after Davina's last words, you can hear the CECOM officer trying to call her and then ordering radio silence until they could get her to answer. Her partner, Keith Kane, breaks in asking if Davina gave her location. CECOM advised that she didn't. It took Officer Kane about seven minutes to find her, but when he did, he immediately asked for rescue. His voice is inaudible as well, but he reportedly said, Officer is down. I do not get a pulse at this time. But let me back up for a moment. You may be asking yourself why Davina was there alone. 
because Chief Grasty's memo about putting Dee back in training with her partner was dated October 13th. Her death was on the 22nd. So it was just less than two weeks since she'd been ordered to not ride alone. So why was she alone? The question was largely dodged in court proceedings. Her partner, Keith Kane, merely said it had to do with their dinner break. Further muddying the waters, Chief Karen Grasty had called in the SBI, or State Bureau of Investigation, and asked them to take over the case. But village manager Wade Horn called Brunswick County Sheriff Ron Hewitt and asked him to lead the investigation. He also appointed him official spokesperson for the media, a task that the sheriff basked in, earning him the nickname Hollywood. Not only was the sheriff's department ill-equipped for this investigation, it would be standard procedure for the SBI to get involved with the death of a police officer. But it's clear that Wade Horn and other village officials wanted to keep this investigation in-house. But let's go back to the start of the night Davina was murdered. The evening of October 22, 1999, started uneventfully. Davina and Keith Kane met on the ferry on their way to work. There was a strong wind and rough seas, with swells as high as 12 feet under the full moon. Kane and the ferryboat captain later said that Davina was in high spirits, joking around. She didn't seem depressed or troubled at all. She also helped him with three Hispanic men who were drinking on the ferry. She went over and politely asked them to throw out their drinks, and they did. There was no drama, and the captain was grateful. Once on the island, Davina and Keith did some paperwork at the police trailer before going out on patrol. They returned, and at around 10.30, they got a call from the manager at River Pilot Restaurant. She said they had some guests whose golf carts went missing. The manager asked them if they could get a police escort to get the guests back to their house. Davina answered yes, they would be there, and asked if this was in reference to a larceny, meaning were the golf carts stolen. No, they're just missing, was the reply. The manager thought that someone had just taken them by mistake. But when Davina and Officer Kane arrived, the river pilot was closed up and no one was there waiting. They walked next door to the restaurant Ebb and Flow and asked questions, but their staff knew nothing. They suggested the officers talk to the ferryboat captain because he had just taken their staff off of the island. Employees at Ebb and Flow noted that Davina peeled out of the parking lot towards the ferry. She and Keith were still in separate vehicles, but they went together. Dee was probably pissed that they were called out for nothing. But instead of heading to the ferry, she and Keith went over to Old Baldy. Earlier in the evening while on patrol, they had seen an abandoned golf cart there and thought maybe it was related to the missing carts reported by the river pilot manager. The lighthouse is positioned near a cul-de-sac, and on its left the Bald Head Island Museum was being built at the time. To Old Baldy's right was the village's municipal buildings, the post office, town hall, and the village association building, and finally the small chapel where weddings took place. In fact, there was a wedding scheduled for Sunday morning for a very prominent family on the island. When Davina and Keith found nothing, he called dinner time. Dee had already eaten, so according to Keith Kane, she said she was going for a ride or out to smoke a cigarette. Officer Kane claimed that he offered to go with her and she declined. This is the explanation for Davina being alone that night. So they split up. Davina went to a phone booth and called Scott Monson at 11.30 p.m. As she drove back towards Old Baldy, she passed three people in a golf cart returning to the island from the last ferry. They were driving on the wrong side of the path, so Dee rolled down her window and told them to get over. This was at 11.45 p.m., according to the people on the golf cart. Then she headed to the cul-de-sac alone and backed her truck in to be facing out on the road. There are no streetlights in the area, and the cul-de-sac is connected to the marina by a wooded golf cart path. It wasn't unusual for officers to park there and do paperwork or smoke and just watch the road. And backing in is standard for police officers. But it was just three minutes after she had passed the golf cart on the wrong side of the road when she called in and said, show me out with three. Within seconds, she was dead, and her partner got to her seven minutes later. But when he first got there, he found her truck, but not her. The parking lights were on and the engine was running. He walked over to Old Baldy and noticed that the door was open. He shined his flashlight around inside, but found nothing, so he walked back through the grass to where Davina's truck was. He shined his flashlight into her truck and saw her flashlight laying on the seat. He was now even more alarmed because Davina would not get out of her truck without the flashlight. He shined his light around the perimeter of the cul-de-sac, at first not seeing anything, but then seeing what he thought was a pile of garbage. 
Looking closer, he realized it was Davina. She was lying in the road, face down, with her head turned towards her left shoulder, and her eyes were partly open. He said there was blood flowing from a head wound. He said her legs were out straight, bowed slightly, pointing in the direction of her truck. Her left arm was at a 45-degree angle at about her waist, and close to that was a portable mic for her radio that would have been pinned to her collar. Her other arm was at an angle, too, but higher up and close to her head, and under her hand was her forty caliber Glock. He said it looked as though she had been holding it about two or three inches from her head. If you're wondering why I keep saying he said, it's because there are no crime scene photos with Davina in the picture. The next official on site was Fire Chief Kent Brown, followed by two paramedics he immediately called. He ordered the men to remove her body immediately, which would be in direct contradiction to every crime scene directive in the world. The paramedics simply picked her up by her belt loops and put her on a gurney in the back of the ambulance. Kent Brown later said he considered the area a hot zone, meaning they could still come under fire themselves, and he also said that Keith Kane said he found no pulse, nor was deep breathing, but he was shaken and unsure, so Brown ordered the paramedics to do a quote, in and out, meaning they should quickly pick Davina up and take her to a hospital. In my opinion, you have a police officer and a fire chief, both trained in medical rescue, who would know how to search for signs of life. Then you have two paramedics who definitely would have known Davina was already dead and with a head wound like that, not going to be brought back. And yet, inexplicably, they moved her body, altering the crime scene. After the ambulance left, Kent Brown claimed he had business elsewhere and left, though he had proclaimed the scene a dangerous hot zone. Officer Keith Kane, in shock and afraid, was left alone to guard the scene. Kane later said he was afraid someone would grab Davina's gun in the darkness so he grabbed it and moved it to the passenger floorboard of his own vehicle. Again, tampering with the crime scene. I give Keith Kane more benefit of the doubt because he did appear to be genuinely shaken up, but even an inexperienced police officer should know better. He obliterated any fingerprints that might have been found on the weapon, including Davina's. And Keith Kane was actually the second person to move the gun. When Kent Brown and the paramedics were there, the gun was either picked up or kicked in between Davina and Keith's trucks. Again, every principle of crime scene preservation was ignored, and no one would even fess up to who moved the gun the first time. At least Keith Kane told the truth about when he moved it. Soon, Police Chief Karen Grasty and other officers arrived and noted that there was a bloody palm print on the back of Davina's truck and that there were drag marks in the gravel leading to her body. It looked like she had been shot close to her truck door and then dragged over to the side of the road. Davina's body was already moved and being transported to the ferry, so Chief Karen Grasty left the scene and rushed to the ferry. When she left, she gave orders for the scene to be secured and put Officer Robert Willis in charge. Davina was taken to the ferry to be transported to the hospital on the mainland. Employees from the Ebb and Flow restaurant had heard the gunshot and were ordered to the ferry to leave the island immediately. When they got to the dock, they saw Officer Davina Buff Jones lying uncovered out in the open on a gurney. In fact, one of these employees was Jamie Grasty, Chief Karen Grasty's daughter. Yes, you heard that right. They left a slain police officer on a gurney out in the open on the dock for anyone to see. Mind you, they were supposedly taking her to the hospital for treatment. So leaving her unattended, without so much as a compress on her head wound, is beyond strange. It is also an incredibly disrespectful way to treat a police officer's body. After some time, Davina's body was moved to the depot office on the dock, still uncovered and unattended. When Chief Karen Grasty and her husband got to the dock, they found Davina lying exposed on the gurney, being loaded onto the ferry. They took a sheet, covered her, and placed the gurney between them, clenching it together to protect her on the ride over. Evidently, there had been no consideration whatsoever that Davina's body should be covered to preserve evidence, if not for common decency. Also, I want to note again that Davina's body was supposedly moved in a rush to get her medical treatment, and yet it's pretty clear everyone knew she was dead and weren't even guarding her body, much less trying to help her. Back at the crime scene, more officers had arrived and Fire Chief Kent Brown suddenly re-arrived and cleaned out the back of the ambulance. Again, why was that such an urgent task? By 12.50 a.m. Saturday, the 23rd, crime scene tape cordoned off the area. 
The interim bald head police chief, Gene Hardy, and Brunswick County Sheriff Ron Hewitt arrived, along with Dee's training officer, Robert Willis, who was left in charge of the crime scene. Chief Hardy was acting police chief because Karen Grasty was on medical leave with a back injury, though she was called at home and she rushed to the scene. Hardy ordered Kent Brown to move his fire truck, but aerial photos from later in the day would show the truck was still on scene. Chief Hardy left and went over to the Village Association building to establish headquarters for the investigation. Davina was officially declared dead at Dosher Hospital in Southport. A preliminary investigation by medical examiner Doug Hiltz incorrectly noted her height and weight and furthermore drew the head wound wrong, even adding a non-existent exit wound. He showed the wound to be on the right back of her head with the bullet trajectory going up and left. But in fact, the bullet hole was in the center of the back of her head. Though this issue was hotly debated, I am just going to go ahead and say that it would have been impossible for her to shoot herself in that area. Also, the only gunshot residue was found on the back of her right hand. She was wearing fingerless gloves, and that residue could have easily been from the practice range. In the civil suits her parents brought, one firearms expert declared she could have done it, while another insisted she could not. A sheriff's detective named David Crocker testified, also insisting she could have done it, but then he refused to demonstrate how. The gun was 6.97 inches long and weighed between 3 and 4 pounds. The only way Davina could have shot herself in the back of the head is if she had turned the gun upside down in both hands and reached over the top of her head to place the gun flush with the back of her skull. Though county and state investigators insisted this is how she managed to shoot herself, no one could ever successfully demonstrate this in court. You should also remember how small Davina was. She had very short arms matching her stature. It's just not possible. What is possible, however, is how the first medical examiner, Doug Hiltz, drew and characterized the wound. He put it at the bottom right base of her head, where she could have easily placed it with her right hand. But the drawing, with its imaginary exit wound, was a complete lie. When questioned on how he could make such a grievous mistake, he said it was 4.30 in the morning and he was tired. To say this man is ridiculous and unprofessional is an understatement. But frankly, one could also say he was helping to frame law enforcement's narrative supporting a ruling of suicide. But back to the timeline, Davina's body had been sent to Jacksonville for a formal autopsy at 10.30 a.m. that Saturday, some 10 hours after her murder. Medical examiner C.L. Garrett conducted a full autopsy with witnesses and photographs. He actually drew the bullet wound wrong as well, but it was in the right spot on the back of her head. It was just drawn upside down. But photographs prove the exact location in the middle, dead center of the back of Davina's head. Incidentally, and even more suspiciously, the police refused to let Davina's family see the autopsy photos. They would never have seen the wound for themselves had the funeral home not allowed them to view her body before cremation. Detective David Crocker, Sheriff Ron Hewitt, and District Attorney Rex Gore met with Davina's family in the Buff home. And when Crocker insisted the wound was closer to her right ear, Hewitt and Gore backed him up. Tanya, Davina's sister, stunned the men when she told them the family had seen the wound for themselves and knew it couldn't possibly be suicide. Sheriff Hewitt exclaimed, I thought she was cremated, to which Tanya explained that the funeral director let them view Davina's body. According to the family, all three men became visibly uncomfortable and changed the subject. It would have been much easier to insist it was suicide if the family hadn't seen the wound for themselves. They have repeatedly told the press that they could have accepted a suicide ruling if the evidence supported it. They were not blindly defending their daughter. They were aware of her depression and the suicide attempts when she was a teenager. The Buffs had not even heard the police tape yet of Davina's call, but they had already seen what was found in Dee's house. On her kitchen table was a to-do list for that Saturday. She had noted that she needed to buy heartworm pills for her dogs and laundry detergent, as well as pick up a prescription for herself and take care of some repairs on her truck. Most suicidal people are not leaving lists like this, and her family insisted she would never have left her dogs unattended and that she was not depressed. Her best friend Lauren also backed them up. She had spoken to Dee several times that week, including the day of her death. She insisted her friend, while disappointed with her job and Scott Monson, was not suicidal or even seriously depressed. She was just resolved to find another job and move on with her life. 
I'm going to pause now for a final commercial break. Back to the timeline, after seeing Davina's body safely to the hospital, Chief Karen Grasty returned by 12.30 p.m. When she got back, the crime scene tape was gone and the area had been hosed down. She was furious, and rightly so. All of the evidence was destroyed, and not only that, her direct orders had been ignored. The scene was hosed down from the hose on the fire engine Kent Brown brought to the scene and which the interim chief had ordered to be removed. And yet now neither the fire chief nor Officer Willis could remember who gave the order to hose down the scene. If I had to guess, and this is indeed speculation, I would say it was Wade Horn, the village manager. Remember, there was a high-profile wedding scheduled for the next morning, but the bride's family wanted pictures taken the Saturday before. The crime scene was just steps from the chapel and Old Baldy. So the scene was completely washed down, and over 70 tourists were able to go and visit Old Baldy that Saturday without having to see a bloody crime scene. Luckily, there were some photos snapped of parts of the scene, including droplets and drag marks, but all of this was washed away, and the pictures, taken in the dark cul-de-sac that night, were not of high quality. The decision to hose down the crime scene was pure business. We can't have visitors thinking there's violent crime on the island. We can't tell that prominent family to postpone their pictures, now can we? Not just for the death of a police officer. And interestingly, by 11.30 that morning, rumors of suicide were already being spread. Specifically, Norman McLeod, the drug agent who had been supposed to meet Davina that night, was the one telling doctors at the hospital that she had been depressed lately and distraught over a relationship and her work problems, and had been talking of suicide. This man had denied he was on the island to meet Davina, but he did in fact use the ferry pass, and was seen by Ebb and Flow employee and Karen Grasty's daughter, Jamie, wearing camouflage just hours before Davina's death. Norman McLeod seemed bent on not only insisting Dee committed suicide, but that her problems, including the sexual harassment suit, were to blame. And he insisted, quote, There were no complaints of drugs on Bald Head Island. I would know. He said this to a reporter. When word went out about Dee's death, he rushed over to Dosher Hospital, claiming he had a broken foot. He said he had been with a sheriff on a raid on Turkey Trap Road. Okay, what kind of raid? He was a drug agent. What other business would he have on a raid with a sheriff? So I guess there were drugs on that island. He said when he heard about Davina's death, he told the nurse to stuff his foot in a boot and he took the second boat over to the island. Just a few hours after this, he was at the Buff family's home, insisting that Dee was distressed and suicidal, sparking a family member to ask him to leave. And there was no cast or ankle brace, nor did anyone ever see him limping. Had he rushed over to the hospital for an x-ray as a cover or alibi? Well, it's an interesting question, but he wasn't the only suspect. Three men were caught trying to leave the island by boat around 1.30 that morning with their lights turned off. They were stopped and hours later given gunshot residue tests. The GSR tests were clean and they were let go. When Sheriff Hewitt was questioned about that decision later, he claimed the men were upstanding, church-going men that he knew. But in fact, all three had extensive rap sheets with a lot of drug trafficking charges. And you know who these men were? The three Hispanic men that Davina made pour their drinks out on the ferry. There is also an eyewitness who saw three men speeding away from the direction of Old Baldy in a golf cart without lights on. A man named Andy Adams, who had been doing construction work on one of the nearby homes, was sitting on the chapel steps drinking a beer when he heard the shot. He saw the three men right after that. The problem with Andy Adams is he didn't come forward right away. He was scared to get involved, understandably. But his conscience bothered him, and he wrote a letter, had it notarized, and sent it to Davina's parents. Davina's parents sued the North Carolina Industrial Commission and the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program. It was after the first court ruling in favor of the Buff family that Andy Adams came forward. In 2006, the State Bureau of Investigation forced to reopen the case, picked up Andy Adams, handcuffed him, and questioned him relentlessly for three days until he withdrew his statement. They also painted him as an alcoholic and drug addict to further discredit his testimony. Other suspects included people that would normally be looked at first, her ex-boyfriends. Scott Monson had a solid alibi. 
but Will Hewitt, cousin to the sheriff, was unaccounted for several hours that night. But he was dismissed as a suspect anyway. There are myriad other suspects and rumors, and I could go through them all, but as no one was ever charged, it seems pointless. But I would recommend a book for you to read for more detail. A family friend named Elaine wrote out with three, The Murder and Betrayal of Officer Davina Buff Jones. She used the pen name Elaine Buff and self-published the book with the cooperation of Davina's family. She names several suspects and uses pseudonyms for others, like a prominent man on the island she called capital A Crook. This man was supposedly heard confessing, saying, quote, I had the bitch put down for messing with my business. And he was also known to be a major drug trafficker. Another island resident that was suspected, Elaine Buff dubs Mr. Sleazy. Almost every avenue of investigation leads back to some sort of drug activity that Davina stumbled onto. Despite Norma McLeod's denial, there was plenty of drug activity on that island. Honestly, it was the perfect place for trafficking. Remember, Old Baldy's light does not rotate. It shoots straight up into the air. That's not helpful for boats trying to avoid the shoals, but it's super helpful for small planes to navigate onto the island and back out to the water. Also, trucks delivering to the island simply came over on the ferry and were not inspected. It would be even more simple than a plane to bring drugs in that way. But no one on the island wanted this to be about drugs, nor did they want to say it was murder. Just hours after Davina's death, the rumors of suicide started and District Attorney Rex Gore would officially rule it a suicide six weeks later, closing the case. He cited her depression and suicide attempts in her past before all evidence was even turned in. The police recording had been sent to Quantico for enhancement and was not even back yet when Gore closed the case. That's the recording where Davina can be heard pleading with someone to put the gun down. Disgustingly, Gore even speculated that Davina didn't sound panicked and that it was faked. As though police officers are not trained to remain calm in dangerous situations. And Davina does sound calm, as though she is trying to defuse the situation while at the same time signaling to her partner and CECOM that she was in trouble. In the two lawsuits the Buffs brought against the Industrial Commission and Benefits Program, Davina's mental health was the basis for the defense. And while she did have issues in her past, ultimately it didn't matter and the Buffs won both cases. When Davina was a teenager, she wrapped a belt around her throat while sitting on her bed. She didn't tighten it very much, or try to hang herself, but when her sister found her like that, the family was alarmed. And not long after that, still a teenager, Davina swallowed enough Tylenol to have her stomach pumped. This, I think, would be a more credible instance of attempted suicide. And it would be why, as an adult, Davina took her mental health seriously. She saw her family physician for a while, who then referred her to a psychiatrist in Wayne County. She made 170 visits there during the year she became a police officer and also took antidepressants. Her best friend Laura remarked that considering the stress she was under at work and the heartbreak of her last relationship, it's not surprising she sought therapy. It was healthy. And if any of the evidence had supported suicide, it would have been an understandable ruling. But number one, we have the radio call to CECOM. That would be quite an elaborate setup for a suicide, which is what D.A. Gore insisted she did so that her family could collect on her death benefits. Number two, Davina could not possibly have shot herself in the back of the head in the way the wound indicated. Law enforcement were never able to prove this theory. In addition to this point, Davina had no bruising or abrasions on her face or upper body that would be expected if she fell from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Number three, Her family, best friend, and ex-boyfriend, Scott Monson, all insisted she was not suicidal. You know who did? The jilted ex and relative of the sheriff, Will Hewitt. He said that she told him her life was falling apart and she just wanted to swim out in the ocean and never come back. His testimony is not at all credible, considering that Davina had broken off contact with him and by all accounts was a bit afraid of him. And what did he have to gain by making up this story? It's not clear, except that he had a direct conflict of interest being related to the sheriff. Furthermore, he had no alibi for several hours that evening. It would look better for him and his cousin the sheriff if Davina had killed herself. And there are many other evidentiary issues. 
Davina's service clock was supposed to be preserved for evidence, and yet it was quickly cleaned and then put in a surplus cell on the island. Dee's shoes also went missing, and no one can explain why. Could they have shown scuffs or blood that would prove she had been moved as the drag marks indicated? There is also a documented scuff mark on the right knee of Dee's pants and abrasions on that knee. This would be indicative that she was forced to kneel, and it would also explain why there was no bruising from the force of the fall after the shot. Also, the majority of blood at the scene was found under her body, though there were drops everywhere, including in the drag marks. Author Elaine Buff speculated that the assailant used Davina's police coat that was found in her truck to try and muffle the sound, and that's why more blood wasn't found by her truck. I think it's more probable that she was forced to kneel, shot, and then quickly drug over to the side of the road before the blood really started flowing. And there are other problematic factors. During the radio call, Davina first called in via Channel 1, the channel typically used by police to advise that she was out with three. But when you hear her pleading with someone to put down the gun, she was on Channel 2. Only her partner, Keith Kane, and CECOM would have access to Channel 2 and have been able to hear that transmission. It is a more clear channel, and she probably realized she was in trouble and that her partner could get to her the quickest, so she switched to Channel 2. But when her body was found, the radio she wore on her shirt that she had switched on for her partner to hear had been switched back to Channel 1. To me, this indicates someone familiar with police radios. They probably thought that the caller radio should match the one in her truck. Also, the squeal heard on the tape could be feedback from another radio. We cannot know what exactly happened to Davina that night, and though both her interim chief, Gene Hardy, and the regular chief, Karen Grasty, fought tooth and nail for a better investigation, they were blocked by the sheriff, the DA, and the SBI. After she found the crime scene washed down, Chief Karen Grasty said she, quote, raised hell so they sent me home. Wade Horn and Mayor Kitty Henson told me to go home and shut up. When she tried to get the investigation reopened, she was told repeatedly to leave it alone. Also, Bald Head Management told workers at River Pilot Cafe and Old Baldy Lighthouse that they were not to talk about the case to anyone or they'd be fired. It is important to note that no one who worked on this case lasted long after. Karen Grasty was finally granted disability for her back just a few months after the murder. Jean Hardy asked for and was given a demotion with a pay cut to go back down to being a corporal. He was sick and tired of Wade Horn and the rest of the higher-ups on the island denying the truth. He worked until he got his retirement, and then he became a private detective. Even Wade Horn retired, claiming he wanted to spend more time with his daughter. Keith Kane transferred to the Brunswick County Sheriff's Department, and though he initially reached out to Davina's family, he never returned their calls and he testified down party lines at the civil hearings. Fire Chief Kent Brown resigned at the request of the new village manager that replaced Wade Horn. And it gets better. Sheriff Ron Hewitt was brought up on federal charges for obstruction of justice. He was accused of sexual harassment, witness tampering, and embezzlement, but he pled to the one charge of obstruction and served a year in 2007. He was brought up on charges again in 2014 for stockpiling guns. District Attorney Rex Gore, who had quickly ruled Davina's death a suicide, famously said, Only God and Officer Jones know what really happened. Yes, you're right, you corrupt asshat. Because the crime scene and all the evidence was destroyed in a cover-up you helped orchestrate. In 2011, he lost re-election for district attorney, and the new DA, John David, immediately reopened the case and went after Rex Gore. In August of 2013, Rex Gore pled guilty to conspiracy and fraud, along with an assistant DA, for falsifying travel reimbursements. He took a plea deal for a misdemeanor of willful neglect to discharge of duty of his office, and prosecutors dropped the felony charges. He was given a six-day suspended sentence and was put on probation for 18 months. This reminds me of how they finally got Al Capone for tax evasion. DA John David was unable to charge Rex Gore with any wrongdoing in Davina's case, but he managed to get him on this paperwork fraud. Gore would never work in public office again. And DA John David has vowed to keep the case open and keep digging for answers. But with no physical evidence or a crime scene, there is little hope that anyone will ever be charged. 
Davina's family was successful in both of their civil suits against the Industrial Commission and the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program. The first ruling got Davina's official manner of death changed to undetermined, and the second ruling finally got it changed to homicide. And her family did receive her death benefits of $50,000. But this was never about the money. This was about clearing their daughter's name. They may not have been able to get justice for Davina, but they were successful in proving she didn't commit suicide. As for what really happened that night, I'll give you my own theory. I think Davina saw and recognized the three Hispanic men from the ferry out on a golf cart in the cul-de-sac. I think she radioed from her truck, indicating that she would be out with three because she got out to question them. I think they immediately disarmed her when she exited the cab, forced her to her knees, and shot her execution style before dragging her body to the side of the road and then fleeing on the golf cart as seen by Andy Adams. I think it's fair to assume, based on their rap sheets, that she did in fact interrupt a drug deal and was murdered for what she saw. Davina Buff Jones was a good cop and a good person. And despite her size, despite being outnumbered, despite the obvious danger in the darkness of that cul-de-sac, she acted fearlessly as a police officer and it cost her her life. Her family never got over her death and refused to let her memory die. Davina's beloved dogs, Adam and Precious, mourned in their own heartbreaking way. After her death, her parents had taken the dogs, as well as Davina's truck, which sat in their driveway. Whenever the dogs could break free, they would run to their dead mistress's truck and sit in the cab until someone forced them out. The buffs had to send the truck to Davina's sister to make them stop. The loyalty of those creatures is heartbreaking and stands in stark contrast to the betrayal of Davina by her own department, the state and county police, and the village of Bald Head. As a dedicated officer of the law, she deserved so much better, not just from law enforcement, but from the community she served. But she was thrown away, and her death was covered up as quickly as possible so Baldhead Island could go on portraying itself as a safe, luxurious vacation spot where there is no violent crime and the sandy beaches and million-dollar homes could still be a playground for the rich and carefree folks on Turtle Time. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Thank you so much to Ali R. for suggesting Davina's case. Special thanks to author Elaine Buff. I encourage you all to buy her book, Out With Three, The Murder and Betrayal of Officer Davina Buff Jones. She had incredible access to sources, both within law enforcement and with the family. And her book has really interesting theories in much more detail than I could ever provide. As always, if you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. You can also listen directly from Spreaker, my network online, or their app. And I'm also on Stitcher, CastBox, and many other podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, I have a Patreon page with many different rewards for different levels of donation. Or you could visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, where you can make a one-time donation just by hitting the donate button. I also have a merchandise store open. Just go to whatamaneuver.net and click on Shop by Store, then search for Southern Fried True Crime. I have all sorts of t-shirts, tanks, hoodies, and even onesies for babies. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing Davina's case or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my Southern Fried True Crime Facebook page. And we don't just discuss cases. We share memes, make friends, and even debate Southern pronunciations. Also a quick note, Facebook's algorithms recently dumped a lot of people from closed groups if they seemed inactive. It wasn't me. If you just enjoy lurking and got dumped, come on back. We'd love to have you. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.